Hi everyone, uh, my name is Thomas Hancock, uh, no relation to Matt Hancock. Um, I'm going to be talking about <laughs> similarity and choice behavior using R, what does my model actually capture? And basically this is really kind of building on from John's presentation. So I apologize to the people online who've come in a bit later and missed some of what John said. So I'm going to give just a couple of very brief examples of choice models, just in case you didn't see John's presentation. And then I'm going to talk about an example where we've used simulated choice behavior. So we're covering preference heterogeneity using simulated choice behavior. I'm going to give a comparison of uh, state of preference data with simulated data. So how can we understand choices uh, from discrete choice experiments that are given this, this state of preference data by comparing it to simulated data? And then I'll just go through a brief sort of section on how we actually generate choice data. So what we have here is just a single choice model. Now, a single choice model, um, you have a set of choices that you observe in some way. That could be real world data, state of preference data. Uh, and you have some number of choices from each individual. Uh, what your choice model will do is it will aim to maximize the probability of observing all of the choices in your data set. So we're going to maximize the likelihood of the model. So we're going to just uh, estimate some set of parameters which will maximize this likelihood. A latent class model uh, recognizes the fact that not all individuals have the same preferences. Um, so we're going to have a set of models, uh, classes, where the preference for different attributes is going to be different in these different classes. So what we now have is just this additional component in the red here. We've got a number of different models and we're going to allocate shares to these models. So for example, you might have a model based on uh, random utility maximization and that gets a 60% share. And then you might have a model based on regret, want to regret minimization, which John mentioned, which is going to get a different share. And um, so you have uh, class specific parameters, which are the parameters within the model, and you have the class share. So there's like this class allocation part as well. And again, we're just going to aim to maximize the likelihood of observing all of these choices. You can alternatively do model averaging. So model averaging is, is a surprisingly underused uh, feature within choice modeling. It's, it's very popular in some fields like weather forecasting. Uh, I know in some medical statistics it's, it's used, it's used in for machine learning purposes uh, quite a bit as well, but uh, we often don't really use it in choice models, I suspect it's a case in a lot of other place modeling cases, so it's, it's not really used. Uh, we like to have one model that explains everything, don't we? So what we do in model averaging is basically we say, within the choice models, is we say, let's first estimate all of those models separately, we then put them into the later class structure, and we now estimate the class allocation part. So we're doing this sort of two stage. And this has a lot of benefits in that you could have different classes where the different models are very, very complex and you run into uh, identification issues and numerical issues, all sorts of things can happen if you've got very, very complex models. Uh, runtime could be a big, big thing. So maybe you can't actually do a latent, fully flexible latent class model. Um, and the model averaging is going to re represent the fact that some people are better explained by some models compared to others, and then you can still use this class allocation to understand that. And uh, that class allocation can also be, uh, you can use various related to the individuals to assign people to more to one class compared to the other, and that can uh, vary as, as you wish. And the nice thing also about model averaging is I don't actually need to know about the underlying models to use this. So uh, a paper we're currently working on is basically where we made a few available data sets. We've said to people, go and do your models on this. And I've brought the models back and we're using model averaging on this. So I actually don't need to know what people are really doing. Obviously it's good if I understand it, but it, it is possible. So just a very brief example of what model averaging actually means, because I'm going to be talking about this in terms of looking at creation of data as well. We've got this random utility model, a random regret model. We get the estimates for those two, two, two models. We then use a latent class model where those estimates are fixed. And we estimate just the class allocation. A fully flexible latent class model, you estimate all of those parameters simultaneously. 
And that would be possible for some, in some cases, but a lot of times it wouldn't be possible. So what I'm gonna give this example here is using modal averaging to disentangle confounding sources of heterogeneity. It's basically, people have different preferences. There's all different reasons, many different reasons that that could be. So people could have different sort of preferences in terms of tastes or various uh, variables that are sort of driving people's choices, or they can make decisions in entirely different ways. So some people might be utility maximizers, others like regret minimizers. Uh, we use John talked about decision field theory where people sort of consider their options, and that might be a better way of representing behavior for some people, maybe not. Um, you could use models with heuristics, uh, like sort of graphic models, uh, models based on decision rules. And what model averaging does is it forces each class within the latest class model to capture the behavior of all individuals. So basically, um, there's going to be outliers. But your different models going into this are going to have different outliers. So the reason what this means is that uh, if you use model averaging, it can't typically capture taste heterogeneity because it's got to explain, each component has got to explain all individuals because each component has been maximized over the full set of choices. So what actually is my aim here? Basically, latent class models allow for taste heterogeneity, more taste heterogeneity than model averages. So if I have a fully flexible model, it's going to capture taste heterogeneity. If I use a model average, it's not. But if I have very different models in the classes of my latent class model, what is that actually capturing? So if I have, for example, a, run and a random utility model and a regret model, is it decision rule heterogeneity or is it taste heterogeneity, preference heterogeneity that my model captures when I use a latent class model? And that's what I'm going to try and look at here. So basically, model averaging results in improved models because it's capturing the fact that different models explain different individuals better but does not capture taste heterogeneity. So it might capture the precision or heterogeneity, but not taste. So I can try and disentangle those out. So simulated data, why is that going to be really helpful here? If I start with tests where I know exactly what the data generation process is for how choices are made, then I can understand what is captured by these different models. So I'm going to test data sets that have been generated with and without heterogeneity. Uh, taste heterogeneity and with and without decisional heterogeneity. So uh, taste, for example, it could be simply that some people are more cost sensitive. A uh, decision rule, rule is the example where they're given the maximization of utility or minimization of regret. And then we're going to compare results from model averaging and latent class models. And then we'll be able to compare capacity results from real data with those from the simulated things. So first two cases. Um, I've got two data sets here with no heterogeneity at all. Everyone has explained, made their choice under a random utility model, or everyone's made their choice under this uh, other model. It's called a pure random regret model. It's just a slight variant. And basically, what module averaging does is it applies all of the, these four different models I've tested on it, and it will allocate a share, and it comes back with the first case 100% share to the random utility model. So basically, it uncovers the underlying data generation process, uh, similar with the pure random regret model, it's uh, 92%. Uh, we, if we move to a latent class model, it doesn't make any difference, which is what we'd expect. The data was created with just one underlying position, uh, data generation process. If we now have taste heterogeneity, so this is case three and four, we've got uh, two sets of tastes under a random utility model, or two sets of tastes under the, the regret. And what we find is that the latent class model does make a difference, but the largest share for model averaging is indeed going to the model with those components. So the model with two random utility models, get 76% share we're seeing there, or the one with two pure random components is getting 82% share. Makes sense, that is the underlying generation process. If we have decision rule heterogeneity only, uh, what we then see is that having a latent class model on this does not make a significant difference, um, but averaging across the different base models is again recovering the underlying process. So um, we're seeing a good share going to all four models in case seven, where all four models are used to explain some behavior. 
And there's quite a nice interesting thing here happening that is that the, the random regret model gets a larger set than 35%, but that's because random regret is somewhere between the random utility and the pure uh, random regrets. So actually that makes complete sense that it's kind of doing a good job of explaining both, which is why it's a slightly higher value there. Finally, both types of decision rule, both types of heterogeneity. Uh, we've got taste heterogeneity and decision rule here. And now what we're seeing is that if uh, we have just the two decision rules, um, the, the final latent class model, which has those two decision rules, again, gets a higher share, 72%, 76%, 76%. But if you've got more than two, what happens is um, we, if we average over various different latent class models, we see very small shares to the sort of best model. And that makes sense because what we have here is that different models explain different individuals better. Even once we've got the latent class models that account for the fact that people have different tastes. But we've only got two, so actually we'd need to move to maybe three or four uh, classes in a latent class model. So conclusions from the simulated case studies. The high share in model averaging can indicate the possible data generation process. Model averaging can uncover decision rule heterogeneity because the share starts splitting across models. A low share for the best model implies that further heterogeneity exists in some form or other. So I've got a couple of case studies and uh, you'll have to forgive me for the fact that these are based on travel behavior. That's just where my data comes from. Um, but it, the theory is exactly the same, whatever your data is. So whether it's uh, health, whether it's marketing data, uh, Travel behavior, it doesn't matter. So the, the first case study is just um, people making choices based on whether they want to take a, a faster route that's more expensive or a slower route that is um, cheaper. And the second case study is a slightly more complex because you've got those choice tasks where, for example, the first one is, uh, do you choose the alternative with my current travel time and current salary, or do you make a choose to make a choose a, new job where your commute is longer but you get paid more so it's kind of working out what are you willing to accept for in terms of additional journey time for more salary um, and then the second sort of set is is, is, is about partners but it doesn't it, the, these details don't really matter actually so i'm not going to spend any time on that basically in our first case study we see that 100 percent of the share goes to one particular model and there is no gain for model averaging. For the second case, as we see, there is a difference for model averaging. So that's already looking like there is some decision rule heterogeneity in the second case, but not the first. If we look at latent class models, again, we see a big improvement in the first case. So that's suggesting there's some taste heterogeneity there, but there's a large share going to one model here, 60%. So that's implying that there is still only um, taste heterogeneity there. Because there isn't a gain from using averaging across all of these different types of latent class models. In the second case, completely different again, we see a huge improvement from using model averaging. So that's saying that different pairs of models predict different individuals better. So basically, what we have here is we've got three models that contribute significantly to the model average. So there's three different latent class models that are are uh, helping understand behavior. So conclusions from these, these case studies, the full the first one, full model action share is given to a single model, large gain model fit by moving to a latent class models, large share to a single latent class model. This is equivalent to simulated data set number three. Strong evidence of taste heterogeneity, but no evidence of decision rule heterogeneity. Case study two, we see large gains by moving to pick across, averaging across base models, and by moving to latent class models. And this suggests that, um, so model averaging shares are split across latent class models. So we end up with an equivalent model to uh, our simulated data set number 11, which says that is both taste heterogeneity and decision rule heterogeneity. So basically what I've done here is by using the simulated data, I can better understand what is the underlying uh, driver of behavioral differences in our choice models. Right, so just, a, a bit on the R and how, how I actually do this. So here's an example, uh, and this is again using Apollo. So 
my supervisor for my PhD was Stefan Hess, so this is one of his, his, his package, so I, I used it extensively. Um, and the nice thing here is, it, because you sort of have to write it out, it does help you understand the model as well. So what I've got here is, is just a simplified version of one of the examples on the Apollo uh, website. And this is just looking at which uh, treatments, which drug treatment I'm gonna choose uh, across four different modes. Sorry, four different alternatives. Um, and this is just the sort of standard multinomial logic model. So it's the sort of the base choice model. So once I've got my, uh, my function for my choice model, um, what I'm going to look at here is uh, choosing parameter values. So I'm going to choose my sort of data generation process here. So uh, there's a thing called Apollo Beta, which contains my set of parameters. And I'm going to come up with some parameters values for, for their sort of estimates for that. For data generation, uh, for when we're creating this, we can choose these values. And these values could be based on uh, previous work results, intuitions, expectations. Um, so for example, what I've got here is uh, there's a parameter for a fast acting uh, drug and a parameter for uh, the, a double strength. I'm going to make an assumption that the double uh, uh, drug having double strength is going to be more valuable, uh, have more utility for that than fast acting. So what we're going to then do is we can test whether which of these parameters are recoverable. So basically what that means is, do these parameters actually influence our choices and can we then recover those values? So what parameters here actually have an impact in our model? So um, really simple to actually uh, generate new choices. What I've done here is I've used this Apollo probabilities uh, function and changing functionality, well, it was functionality equals estimate before, means that rather than estimating those parameters, I'm going to use the parameters that I've set and generate basically probabilities of each of the alternatives. So here you see on the right, <coughs> the pro probability for each alternative under my current model. What I can then do is just do uh, create random numbers. And I'm going to take basically a uniform draw, select an alternative based on these probabilities. So then I'm creating a choice based on that data. And that's how we do pretty good choice, choices there. So you can then check for parameter recovery. And in this case, study we've got very low uh, uh, differences, um, basically suggesting that those uh, parameters that I've got are very stable, which is good. So that means that what my model uh, estimates is what I think it estimates, basically. So finally, just a sort of outline for other reasons we might want to create data and why, why this would be particularly helpful. And this applies, for, I mean, I'm thinking of this from a choice model perspective, but it's transferable. Um, so basically, <clears throat> we can check whether a parameter can be expected to have any impact on choice behavior. So basically, is, is that, are these parameters significant enough to be worth including in our model? So you can have an uh, idea for a parameter, sort of from a conceptual reason, you might think uh, of certain segments of the population might behave in a certain way. So we're going to try and capture that with this parameter. But does that parameter actually have the mathematical function that you want it to do? And that's what you can test with simulated data. Um, so checking whether your model captures certain aspects of behavior. You might also be able to check how large a sample you need for your parameters to have some estimates. So this is particularly useful in the case of if you're coming up with a, a state of preference uh, a survey, so you're trying to create a discrete choice experiment, and you want to know how many, what's my sample size needed to find a significant impact, so I can trial that with a, a simulated uh, data set. So basically, I'll be using NGINE to create some choices. I simulate all of these choices and then I look at those um, significance of those parameters and that will tell me uh, whether I can actually recover, my likelihood to recover significant estimates. And finally, what I just did here was to look at whether behavioral phenomena captured in one model can be captured in another. So basically what is captured by model, I have to later fully flexible as class models um, and 
that helps us undercover heterogeneity. And I have borrowed this advertisement for Apollo from Sam. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much. Um, so I think I ended up as the chair of this, despite knowing very little or nothing about uh, choice modeling. Um, but model averaging is something that is often posed for a survival analysis and yeah. income modeling. There's often quite a lot of resistance to it, I think, because it obscures what the true underlying model is. Is it similar in choice modeling? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's this, um, I'd say, uh, stubbornness for people to want to have a model that explains every old behavior and there's this idea that you can't really average across uh, outputs in these models but certainly for if you have an output that is on the same scale from different models so we, are, we were just talking about this before was, so for example if you have a probability from each model and you've got this as an output then you can average across that and that means you can then average across other outputs such as willingness to pay so I might have one model that gives me some distribution of how much people are likely or willing to pay for a certain new treatment. And another model might give a entirely different distribution, but model averaging can then average across these two distributions. So depending on whether your models have the sort of same sort of outputs, then yeah. yes, it can be Yeah, I imagine if models are getting alter ratios and hazard ratios would be Yeah, yeah, it's still a bit tricky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, are there any questions from the audience, um, either online or in person? You can open up the chat. I think there was one clarification clarification question asking, um, what is a test? But I'm not, maybe Arthur would like to clarify that. Uh, Anthony? So, choice modeling is completely new to me. The Apollo side of it, it seems to be a very well, from what you both described, more of a look at the package. And it seems like the maintainers that have gone to promote that, followchoicemodeling.com. Is this kind of a, a yeah, just a, a path you suggest people are promoting things? Because it, it's clearly one of two of you over there, a lot of this has been built around Apollo. And it's not just about the functionality, it's at least loads of things like, yeah, if you want the most fully featured thing, it could be doing everything. Windows, yeah. So, so um, yeah, I mean, just a sort of more general kind of reflections that you've got on Yeah, so the how it works and how it's sort of successful. Yeah, so the, there's a few different competing uh, packages. The thing about Apollo is that um, the my supervisor Stefan has done choice modeling teaching for a long time, and he sort of refined the way he teaches and. He's gradually got to the point where he, he basically believes the best way to sort of really teach it is to have codes which you can sort of see the individual steps of what's actually happening in your model. And that model allows for that. You, sort of have, you, you can build your individual sort of steps, but there's sort of inbuilt parts which are going to do the sort of underlying uh, calculations that are going to stay constant across different models. So, uh, for example, the multinomial logic model, the, the, at the end of the day, to converting utilities into probabilities is a very um, set function. You don't need to do that. That's kind of, there's a line for that that's going to kind of do that. But you can build your utility equations as you think should sort of work. And so I, I'd say the nice thing about Apollo at the moment is that they're getting so many downloads at the moment. So it's, it's really, um, there's a lot of people using it, and this means that it's it's been quite extensively tested now. Now, that's not true for all models within the Apollo package. So, for example, decision field theory, which I developed in my um, in, in my PhD thesis, and um, we added that into Apollo, and um, I've had a few people question uh, asking questions, but through um, John and my our, our master student. We uh, uncovered that there was a couple of cases that it was kind of dealing with, so that kind of helps. That the feedback goes goes through. Now the thing is, currently there isn't any other package with decision field theory, so I, I don't see it as a bad thing that we don't know that it's perfect because at the moment you'd be having to do the whole model from scratch otherwise. So basically, that's saying to me. Um, 
if someone's doing it from scratch, you know, you, you accept, have to accept that you may have made an error. Whereas if someone's using the Apollo package, they can say, okay, they might find that there's a small error and, you know, fine, but there's, there's some rigor behind it because it's at least been used before. So I hope that helps. Yeah, it's just, um, it's, you know, you clearly a lot of love for it. So, and, and it's, there's not many packages that start with dot com. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's, yeah, so I mean, the Stefan runs uh, choice modeling uh, courses and he uses the problem to teach people choice modeling there. So he, it's nice because, because of that, people who are new to choice modeling are seeing it and therefore uh, there's kind of new criticisms all the time and they're constantly taking feedback and improving it in different ways. So that's, that's I think, been very helpful for them. But he has a whole story about why it's a public, he calls it a public, yeah, so it's uh, yeah. There are no reasons why they call it a public. Just for the audience yeah. online, Gianluca has just asked what if Apollo was named after a Greek god or something. So the answer is yes, but I can't remember the full story. Um, it, it's something to do with um, having this sort of flexibility, but kind of shooting out there and reaching okay. for, you know, new heights. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the online or in-person audience? If not, we can thank Thomas again and all.